following their victory in the Tournament of Power and the unlikely, albeit strictly temporary, alliance with Frieza. Our heroes returned to Earth, saving not only their universe, but the others as well. Everything was back to normal on Earth and the 12 universes for a time, except for the fact that Frieza had been revived. The next spot of trouble caused by Frieza is a tale for another time. Suffice it to say, our two Saiyans emerged from those events stronger than ever. Battle's End and Aftermath Joining the Galactic Patrol And so, time passed. Zipping into West City, at Capsule Corp to be specific, Vegeta scowls at Goku wondering where he's been, to which our happy-go-lucky hero can only utter, oh, you know. Anyway, he wants to know if they're gonna train or not. But Vegeta remarks, not here. The neighbors would complain. They're gonna use the gravity room. Kinda funny to see the Prince of All Saiyans concerned with homeowners association etiquette. While training, he wants to know what happened with Goku and Ultra Instinct. And nothing much. He hasn't pulled it off since the tournament. So this means he can't tap into it at will? What a useless technique! Our hero guesses not. No shortcuts in training, huh? Just gotta keep grinding away. His training partner replies, especially because he never intends to fight by his side again. Which is fine with Goku, because he prefers taking enemies on by himself. As the pair are interrupted by the beeping of an intercom, a voice requests Vegeta and son Goku to come outside. Bulma, she's gotten an urgent call from Hercule. But what could Satan possibly want? Exiting. I always forget how Vegeta no longer uses a spaceship for his training. They inquire the scientist what's up. Who's not quite sure yet. Some mysterious gang showed up at Hercules' place and it sounds like they're kidnapping Boo. But kidnapping Boo? The prince huffs as she surely jests. It's easy to forget, but that creature is incredibly powerful. However, Goku doesn't find this so funny. This must mean they're looking at a new villain, aren't they? Though it's hard to say. It's worth noting Vegeta isn't sensing any powerful energy signatures. Either way, and much to his annoyance, Goku guesses they'd better go check it out. Reaching out his hand, he'll teleport him there. But Vegeta isn't touching that thing, even with gloves on. He hisses for him to get going on his own. He can fly to Herculopolis, which I guess is the alternative of Satan City, in five seconds. If only Vegeta could use instant transmission. Too. However, since that'll never happen, Goku's just left with his feelings hurt. At Hercules' house. Mr. Satan angrily shouts what they're gonna do to Boo. He swears if they take him away. In the courtyard, we see a rather large spaceship and what appears to be Majin Boo lying down on some sort of gurney. Looks like he's taking one of his famous month-long naps. And the gangsters. Their uniforms look really familiar. When Hercule decides to get real, pulling out his sidearm as he has no choice in this, this counts as self-defense to save his friend. Eat this! So having the dexterity and speed to shoot the bullet mid-air, the alien holsters his weapon and calmly reiterates to Hercule that he just explained who they are. Interesting that he knows his name. These guys must have some good intel sources. Satan shouts in excitement at our savior's arrival, who sternly questions these visitors what they're up to. And what do they want with Boo? They're definitely bad guys, right? The world champ is just as happy to see Vegeta's come here too. But Goku and Vegeta, as in THE Goku and Vegeta, but how could this guy have information on them too? Hercule pleads with their heroes to please save Boo, who assure him they're on it without hesitation. <laughs> Easily dispatching the gangsters around Boo, the apparent leader of the crew reaches for his weapon as it seems they've left him no choice. Huh? <laughs> Zapping him! He knocks out Goku cold with a single blast. But how could this device be so powerful and how is this guy so fast? In less than a blink, he's then behind Vegeta as he sets his sights on him next. 
He says he's sorry, but he's taking a short nap too. With both warriors unconscious, the man directs his men to carry these two onto the spaceship as well. They will aid their cause. He'll explain everything to them back at HQ. When we see the emblem that tells us who they are, they must be Anytime Fitness recruiters. In space, a protagonist wakes up to a nasally. Yes, Goku! Hey, I'm talking to you! Huh? Wake up, Goku! Rubbing the back of his head and getting his bearings, he asks what he was doing. The patrolman replies that he was sleeping like a baby. Their stun guns pack a punch, huh? When he finally starts to regain clarity, he recognizes his old friend, would-be assassin, who thinks aloud that he's not sure why he brought them to when Majin Buu would have been enough. Uh, huh? Brought? Where are they? Prompting Jocko to reveal that this is the HQ for their super elite organization, the Galactic Patrol. A name Vegeta remembers. When the man from before enters the room, he apologizes for getting rough with them. They didn't seem to be in any mood to listen to reason. So... So, Goku continues, who is he? The man on our right tells how he's the number one elite agent. Mirrors here manages 104 sectors. With Shaco Chortles, that's a few more than even himself. Of course, Goku has to then inquire just how many sectors Jaco manages. Which, um... Three. But if this guy is so elite, Vegeta wants to know what he needs from Boo. Bringing our focus back to the plot, Maris explains that due to their own negligence, a dastardly criminal has broken out of Galactic Prison. To recapture this villain, they require assistance from a certain individual. Impatiently asking who this individual is. It's someone who slumbers within their Majin Buu. The Great Lord of Lords. Ten million years ago, Nearly getting crushed by what doesn't appear to be a normal meteor. Even the Grand Supreme Kai has to admit that was close. South can't believe this guy is attacking them with actual comets. And in the distance, we spot a blue goatman. Using a technique similar to the Spirit Bomb, though profoundly more malicious and parasitic, the villain destroys another planet according to the South Kai. Unlike the Spirit Bomb, the Fiend doesn't use the energy as a projectile. He instead eats it! Is he absorbing the planet's life energy this way? Firing a surge of lightning in every direction. It looks like he just got even stronger. Even the Lord of Lords thinks this is it. They can't win. Nearby, a duo in a spaceship passively spectate. At this point in time, these guys are known as the Galactic Police, the predecessors to the Galactic Patrol. As a being of the same race as Jocko states, Planet Eater Moro. He's been charged with the destruction of the Aragi star system and bringing about mass extinction on 230 planets. Seeing his strength firsthand, the other comments how this villain is as mighty as they say. Indeed, a terrifying foe. In all honesty, they know there's nothing they can do. The plan at the moment is to leave this to the Lord of Lords and keep an eye on things. Keep an eye on things, maybe from a little farther away. A 
as the monster closes in. If his power grows any further, they'll be helpless to resist. If only they could do something about his magic. When the Lord of Lords states he's got no choice, he'll use up his god power to steal his magic. But what? Does such a technique exist? In fact, he himself created it. He had a feeling it might come in handy one day. It's far too dangerous to teach to anyone else. As the deity powers up, South warns that he mustn't put so much of his strength into it. And so, the great Lord of Lords gave up most of his godly power in order to seal away Moro's magic. Unable to fight back, Moro was locked away in the galactic prison. Well, Moro was still a capable fighter, even without magic, so he was sentenced to death. Unfortunately, nobody could actually kill him, so he was instead given life imprisonment. Vegeta queries, and so this Moro is still alive after 10 million years. Alas, yes. In Goku's words, this guy is old. The shore version is he managed to escape prison, huh? And that's correct. It's likely Moro has regained his magic, so they require the great Lord of Lords power to capture this criminal once again. Although this is well and interesting and all, Vegeta wants to know what any of this has to do with Boo. In five million years after Moro's capture, the great Lord of Lords was absorbed by Majin Buu. Acting like he already knows this information, Goku questions if Vegeta knew that already. Which is possible, but both in the anime and manga, this detail is revealed through a private conversation with Old Kai and Kabito Kai. Maris continues that their only hope is to somehow extract the Great Lord of Lords ability from within Majin Buu, or at least that's what they hope to do. But Vegeta doubts he even possesses this power. Whatever their plan, it wasn't their stun gun that put Majin Buu down. He was sleeping to start with, right? It could be days before he awakens. Looking in close, one of the patrolmen tried to get his attention by cooing. Hello, rise and shine. <laughs> Going full blown Undertaker, Boo choke slams the man and throws him into another officer. Talk about tossing and turning. Snoring away. Jocko wants to confirm that nothing will wake him up. But that's just the kind of guy he is. Miris rubs his chin and mutters, That is a problem. Still, they haven't actually ascertained Moro's location yet, so they're on standby. When Goku gets the bright idea that since they're here anyway, how about he and Vegeta help catch this guy? And if that's not too much to ask, but Goku assures they're happy to. Sounds fun, right Vegeta? For him, all this means is they had the audacity to drag him here. Now they're asking for a favor? Mirus tells how rumors of the two have reached them. They're supposedly quite powerful. To which Goku coyly giggles that he doesn't know about that, since there are still stronger people out there in the universes. They even ran into another Saiyan recently, something Mirus wants to hear all about. Vegeta can't get something off his mind though. This Mirus. He couldn't read his key, but he's far from weak. He didn't just exploit an opening. He was agile enough to get the drop on him in an instant. That speaks to his skill. Mirrors instructs that if they'll come this way, the Galactic King is waiting to hold the induction ceremony. But the Galactic King? Who's that? <laughs> Calling Goku a fool, he reminds that he was there when he fought Universe 6. Ringing a bell in our hero's mind. That octopus looking guy. Who furrows, he's no octopus. As Goku goes to shake his tentacle, as stated during their last encounter, and that's no tentacle. Jocko takes exception to the Saiyan's casual nature. What are they, old friends or something? Know your place! Moments later, the king gives a speech. This induction concerns Son Goku, also known as Kakarot, and Vegeta IV. They are hereby appointed as special members of the Galactic Patrol. Their tenure lasts until the escaped prisoner Moro is captured. They will immediately be dismissed if they are found abusing their authority. Examples of abuse would include cutting in line to buy a parfait, claiming relevance to an investigation, flaunting the Galactic Patrol symbol in order to hit on girls. After the list of condemnable offenses goes on in this manner, Jocko surprises both of them with official uniforms. They got one for each of them. Somehow even more blunt than Vegeta, Goku stammers that he doesn't want to wear that. 
Acclaimed Jocko can't believe. This uniform is the pride and joy of the Galactic Patrol. Plus, the design is super cool. Again, the Saiyan expresses his disinterest in the gear. It actually looks hard to move around in. The GP relents. However, the rules do state they need to bear their symbol, as they appear to scribble something under their geese. Recreating them perfectly, our heroes are actually kind of embarrassed by them. But anyway, Jocko congratulates them on their induction. As their Galactic Patrol superior, he'll be showing them the ropes. First, their victory pose goes like this. Another thing that doesn't interest the duo. While he goes on about the different poses, a group of patrolmen come sprinting down the hallway. Inquiring of the commotion, Miris turns to them and asks what's going on. A short green alien informs us that the Makareni siblings have stolen something again. But again, they never seem to learn. Curious of the who and what on the matter, we find out the Makareni siblings are a bunch of punks who are always out there violating galactic law. Near the doorway, we hear Miris explain that they still have some time, so he'll go out and resolve this himself. To the great relief of his comrades, they have nothing to fear if he's on the scene. The last bit concerning Goku a little. What? He's going somewhere? Who excuses himself, but assures he'll be back shortly. If they could just please wait here in the meantime, this shouldn't take long. When Vegeta butts in and insists on going as well, he wants to see what Miris is made of. Good thinking in Goku's eyes, he'll come too. Smiling, Miris responds, as you wish. Leaving the headquarters, Goku wonders why Jocko decided to come too. He comments that he's in charge of overseeing Earth and its life forms, which means he's got to monitor the two of them. Of course, if they get into any danger, they'll be lucky to have Jocko around. On Planet Jung, we find ourselves in a type of mine or railroad. A man on the train shoots down the pursuing Paw Patrol. Looking close, there are three assailants in the cab. These must be the Makareni siblings. The little one on the right chuckles. That was the last of them, big bro. Said bro chortles back that the mounted forces didn't put up much of a fight. Inside, little bro has used his key to subdue the conductor and his platonic sheep companion. The others chatter that once they sell off this cargo, they'll be rolling in dough. As his sister shouts out for him to look, that ship up there. The Galactic Patrol, he should have known. He'll shoot him out of the sky. Meantime, he commands Getty, little bro, to keep an eye on them hostages. the hatch and getting a clean look of what they're stealing. It's Blue Aurum, a fuel source for all sorts of machines. Like how on Earth they've got Sky Gold Jocko guesses. Ironically, Goku just rolls with this comparison and questions if it's worth a lot. And it's pretty valuable, but it's really bad if criminals get their mitts on it. With as much as they've got down there, they could build a planet-busting bomb. Which, yeah, that's... that's bad. Taking in the situation, Miris mutters to himself, stealing a whole train's worth of blue arm. This is their most audacious caper yet. When Big Bro decides it's time for a train top battle, he taunts, If it ain't Miris, it's been too long, friend. We find out this man's name is Pasta. The patrolman spouts that he's not punching out today until the three of them are locked up in galactic prison. Prompting the spaghetti westerner to throw up his hands and surrender. This was just him saying hi. He'd never actually go toe to toe with them. And if that's the case, he needs to throw down his firearm. Confidently agreeing to do so. He glances over his shoulder. The tracks are changing up ahead. He's able to sneakily do something to his gun as Miris demands he hurry up. Whoops! Ah! 
The villain hollers out to Penne, presumably his sister, that their friends are changing tracks, giving her the signal to jump into action. She's able to stretch out her arms like an Namekian to pull the switch to allow the three of them on one course, the Galactic Patrolman stuck on the other. Pasta then uses what is far superior to a shotgun with no forehead, or maybe a rifle with no sights, and blows away a portion of the tracks. Jocko curses him. That's jerk! That was shady! If only there was something our heroes knew how to do for the previous 553 chapters that could save Miris! Assured of his victory, the bandit bids him farewell. Now he can go boom along with all that blue arum. Indicating this material explodes upon heavy impact. Interestingly enough, Maris doesn't fly, but instead uses the same jets used by his fellow patrolmen. But how is he fast enough to subdue both Goku and Vegeta, yet not know how to fly? He contacts Agent Jocko. He's requesting a retrieval of the Blue Arum. Their mission is not done yet. He's going to head them off at the tunnel's exit, a request Jocko doesn't seem to be thrilled to have received. Taking off as well, Goku puts two and two together and deduces that these boots are how the Galactic Patrol guys fly around. But wait, Miris is gone? Looking over to the other side of the tunnel, he's already over there! Although he managed to make it to the front of the train in only seconds, he's too late. The conductor informs that they've already made their getaway, probably in that spaceship. When Chaco notices something horrible, the cargo's gone too! The Blue Arum! The Macarini speed away with at least one car of loot, all the while laughing their heads off that they managed to get away with it. Before the ship smashes a Goku on its windshield. While the occupants try to figure out who he is, Goku steams that they're not getting away. Now in a panic, he's with the Galactic Patrol, but he can fly! No fair! The situation calming, the Saiyan shouts over to Miris that he caught the bad guys. Who smiles and lets him know that he appreciates the assist. However, Jocko isn't the only one here with a good eye. Vegeta can tell that Miris had already tampered with their spaceship, ensuring they wouldn't get far. So even if Kakarot hadn't caught them, it wouldn't have mattered. Stopping the train took priority because he wanted to save the conductors. So how did he have the time to sabotage their ship? Somehow he missed that. With a couple of innocent lives saved. And a few criminals back where they belong. Jocko jubilantly giggles that this is what happens when they tangle with the elites. Though Goku's social ineptitude, or in this case Grace, has to point out that he didn't really do anything. Cutting right to it, Vegeta comments that Miris could have saved the day even quicker, couldn't he? He's hiding his power, right? His eyes don't lie. Although he claims hardly. Yes, he wanted their spaceship too, so he let them flounder a bit longer. But hiding his power? No. The prince supposes he isn't capable of capturing this Moro on his own then. And he's afraid not. He may be the number one in the Galactic Patrol, but Moro is in another league altogether. A statement Jocko takes a bit of offense to. He continues. Moro's power knows no limits. But Goku asks if this means he's getting stronger and stronger. That's exactly what he means. So if they don't capture him soon, things will go from bad to worse. As the pilot receives a report of some kind, but where and what squad could it have come from? It doesn't mean much to us, though it's explained that the Kusea squad was out scouting and they got a lock of Moro's location. About time for our hero. Passing through Sector KT-40. This is pretty interesting to Miris. He didn't get as far as expected. Turning to Jocko, Goku wants to know what direction that is. Something he's actually pretty good at, directing him to his left. 
Goku has a bit of a secret weapon when it comes to these sort of things. He's gonna do a search of his own. Confused, the patrolman turns to Vegeta. What does he mean? It means he can maybe sense the criminal's key if he knows where to look. As we get our first look at the face of this newest villain, now millions upon millions of years old, how powerful can he really be? Can he really stand up to our heroes? Or will this be an open and shut mission?